Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry I can't be there in person, um, but uh, this is our new reality for a while. Um, hopefully this goes um, okay uh, via a virtual and interactive um, session. Um, and today we're, we're talking about a concept we've been exploring for the past few years called uh, ultra early spring wheat seeding systems. Um, initially started out uh, by myself down here in Lethbridge in collaboration with Rob Graff from Winnowee Breeder um, and Dean Spanner up at the University of Alberta. And then we've been lucky enough to recruit a PhD student, Graham Collier, who many of you would know through New Farm, um, to take over and start um, using this as his PhD thesis. Um, so if I can get this thing moving. Okay. Um, so really the idea about this was um, quite a few years ago now, um, around 2011, 2012, driving down to a meeting in Montana, um, seeing growers at the end of March um, already prepping fields. Uh, I wasn't sure if they were planting um, or just doing land prep at the time, I can't recall, but it, the, the thought occurred to me, you know, that's that's something we should be thinking about because we really are beholden um, or really focused around calendar dates instead of soil temperatures because of, you know, kind of historical um, thoughts and, 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 and beliefs around uh, having things like crop insurance deadlines govern um, how we think about when we plant. And I know for myself, it was always, well, as long as you're in by May 10th around here, uh, you're fine. And so we never really thought, well, how does May 10th compare to 30 days earlier? Uh, is it better? Is it worse? And and so on. And and we do know, so that's sort of smaller context, bigger context is we know over the over the decades that we are facing some sort of climate change and, and that's going to require some sort of adaptation too. Um, and, and, and sort of what we're thinking about in terms of that, that there's all sorts of models out there that are trying to understand and make predictions. Um, they're all sort of based on on scenarios and, and different data and ways of handling that data. But but basically, you know, Canada's Canada is, is poised to have changes with respect to climate like everywhere else. Um, but what we anticipate happening um to a lesser degree in canada are, are some pretty bad negative effects that you can see um, with respect to the different colors on this map around actual changes in yield percentage as temperatures increase um, canada seems to be okay even with the current practices so the, oh, that's sort of built into here as a context within the context of current practices we still seem to be doing okay um, to a point, uh, once we get to four degrees, which is pretty extreme, even in a lot of modeling circumstances, you see a lot of dire situations around the globe, but um, you know, we're starting to lose a little bit in that scenario for sure. But again, that's under the guise or the understanding that we've done nothing in terms of adapting to that new reality of climate change. Um, and then this is simply just a different take on that but you know, some of them, this one being an example, if there wasn't any major change with respect to CO2 levels, Canada is one of those areas in the prairies, you know, those northern latitudes wouldn't suffer quite as badly. And, and some even say that it's possible you could enjoy even a net gain. Um, but the reality is even in today's um, era, um, uh, some farmers are saying, you know, even from the time I started farming to now, um, I could be seeding way, way earlier. Um, and so that's one generation. And so I think, you know, Don Bowles from Three Hills um, I sort of put it quite succinctly. It's not like he's a cheerleader for climate change or what's causing it. It's just that's his reality. Um, and then other studies around the provinces. Uh, from a Canadian context, um, you know, based on data to date, climate scenarios for Saskatchewan, for example, four of seven 
indicate that there's possible decreases in wheat yield. So, so the background of all this is certainly time to start thinking about a different way, perhaps, of, of trying to mitigate against that and adapt against that. And um, this is um, one strategy we decided to explore. And through my interactions with the Global Wheat Initiative, um, it turns out for different reasons, Australia is doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. So my colleague, James Hunt, um, from down under in Australia, they're actually trying to get a type of wheat cycle, life cycle in there that disrupts the current one that is aligned too well to the time of, of uh, terminal drought. And so they've actually made a big switch to winter wheat to try and get the crop adapted before that terminal drought and the tap shuts off. The hypothesis for our on the, ours on this one was, uh, you know, is there is there a strategy where we could go in starting and using soil temperature as a trigger and starting at very cold soils of even zero degrees? Would that protect yield or how would the yield responses be? And are there varieties or genetics out there um, such as cold tolerant um, varieties that would help um, to to add just that extra layer of, of uh, durability. Um, so the first one was really, um, you know, um, understand the risk involved um, and, and really take a look at the, take a look at the uh, management practices and the response we see from looking at conventional genetics, in this case, AC Stetler versus um, um, some breeding lines that Rob had developed that conferred some tolerance to coldness uh, with respect to uh, soils. And so this is what it looked like. We took um, three of kind of the best looking lines that Rob had, and these would these aren't to be to 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 really underscore the point. These are these are classes or a type of wheat that would either be general purpose or um, in the line of, of uh, CPS at best. So they're going to have a higher yield potential. That's why you see in the picture here, they look good compared to Stetler, which is a CWRS. But anyway, three of those lines with Stetler um, and using soil temperature as a trigger uh, to commence with planting at zero degrees, then go back in at two, four, six, eight, and 10 degrees. Um, and, and that was run, you know, we weren't playing it safe and just running it at Lethbridge. We did it at Edmonton, Dawson Creek, Scott, Saskatchewan, and so on, because we really wanted to assess the risk of doing so. Um, and, and this table here kind of underscores the kind of risk that, that you could face. Um, the very first year we did this, um, the trigger to go in at zero, the date associated with that in Lethbridge was March 6th. And following seeding at that particular time, we had 37 days below zero. So I was pretty convinced that that would actually um, negate any advantage of going in early. In fact, probably um, lead us to conclude that you couldn't do it. But um, the the responses we've observed to date uh, uh, were somewhat surprising. Um, and this is kind of the reality that we started to see. Um, really, the if you think about soil temperatures and, and the sort of dates they would correspond to, um, typically, um, you know, when, when the soil in the top five centimeters is reaching eight or 10 degrees, we would probably consider that more the norm of when most people were planting. But we know from what we've observed in our studies is that you consistently get lower yields if you wait that long. Um, and generally in this, particular slide where you have um, your yield on the y-axis and, and a proxy for stability along the x-axis, this coefficient of variation. Um, anything in that green box is good and as you can see most of them are averaging you know two degrees, four degrees, six degrees for the most part um, and not too many eight or tens in there. Um, and the yield, the fact that Stetler is down lower isn't isn't too much of a surprise it's below average yield because those lines are basically cps or general purpose and higher yielding but you should know to the to the left of the red box into and closer to the y-axis 
um, Stettler planted at two degrees is giving out of all the other scenarios with Stettler um, the most stable yield. So that's um, that's a pretty important consideration given the types of conditions we can face from year to year, field to field. And really the conclusion from the first experiment is that going in that ultra early um, had no negative consequence with respect to yield. Uh, we basically protected yield, but we were in earlier. And so all the advantages from being in earlier um, uh, were reaped and, and um, waiting, there was just no point to it. So our proof of concept is, is achieved. And then the second phase to this was studying um, uh, just the more systems to it. So now we're really, you know, honing in on a G genotype by, by management system within an environment of cold soils where we're looking at two different seeding rates, a below average seeding rate of 200, uh, what I would call a, what used to be a high seeding rate, but I think we've now convinced everybody with spring wheat that that would be sort of the conventional seed rate of 400 seeds per square meter or 40 seeds per square foot. We looked at the two lines that are cold tolerant um, and then we planted them at either an inch or two inches deep and running again in, in ranges of zero to three for our first ultra early, comparing that to five, seven and a half or 10 degrees. So each time the soil reached that, we went out and planted um, all the treatments described above. And, and, and so this is what it looks like. If you can see this picture, um, this, these, these are the guys actually, yeah, 2016, the first, the date associated with the first trigger of zero degrees to go out and start planting was February 16th. Um, and so in our case, the genotype are the cold tolerant spring leads. The environment is planting into cold soils and the management is a, is a function combination of, of seeding rate and seeding depth. And so what happened in relation to the results that we found with this one? Well, um, not a whole lot of difference with respect to seeding depth responses. Um, probably slightly more positive responses with going in shallower than deeper, um, but definitely the earlier the better um, with respect to uh, um, soil temperatures again. So um, again, the second phase just confirmed our proof of concept once again, and maybe even more to the point because what we observed in this particular study was anything past two degrees with respect to soil temperature, you start to notice a pretty um, notable yield drag. And so in the one experiment, we saw the system um, no negative effects on yield or no negative impacts for yield. But on this one, this experiment, we're actually seeing a yield drag if you actually waited to plant at the traditional recommended times for planting. Um, and basically that's what this slide is summarizing. Um, now, this slide here is just to, to just to underscore the point that we're, we're not we're, we're not being naive or academic about this. We're trying to build worst case scenarios. What you see before you is, is one year out of uh, probably 14 site years now where we went in at zero where it was still pretty frozen um, using Conservapack or the John Deere, whatever, 1830, I believe, um, narrow knife openers. And so because the soil was still frozen or tight, it ripped up some pretty good aggregates. So you gotta be careful about soil, um, what your soil is like and, and how compatible it is with the type of openers that you have. Um, so that, that was the risk um, that we see. And we certainly don't say that this is gonna work every year at every location. This year, actually 2020 being one of those years where we had quite a late spring and there's nothing you can do about planting if you're in two feet of snow, like some locations were, um, you know, into into April. So, um, but for the most part, it is possible in most areas across the prairies um, as a practice. And in some ways, some of the advantages that we talk about with winter wheat can probably 
apply to an ultra early seeding system of spring wheat as well. And, and the other thing we've observed so far is that we haven't seen any real advantage with the cold tolerant lines. And you would probably have to plant those, say, in, in you know, late fall um, to really see any Im improvement or protection around um, having having the need for cold tolerance just because we've got varieties that are already adapted that way um, by virtue of the fact that they've been bred and, and selected in the northern latitudes. So Graham, he's going to start also looking at other experiments around uh, management because we are sort of disrupting the cult, the conventional system because uh, for one thing, we don't have any weeds when we're going in at zero degrees or two degrees. And so there's no need for a pre-seed burn off of glyphosate or, or some other um, active ingredient like that. So we're looking at using um, um, pre-plant residual herbicides like paroxysulfone and so on in hopes that uh, that's a good alternative. Um, so far, I think it seems to be something that works well we know we've we've uh, published works on that in in winter wheat systems uh, where it, as a pre-plant works quite well and where um, we've got some ongoing studies in winter wheat as well showing um, that it works quite nicely and no real need for incorporation the planting operation itself provides that okay and just a last comment about um, opener type that it's not something you can really influence or, or change overnight on a farm, but if you were thinking, you know, how does my opener type af affect my chances of being able to adopt such a system, I would have predicted that um, the using a, a, a disc opener, and in this case we're using a pillar laser disc opener that, you know, it probably wouldn't be as prone to lifting up and pulling up big aggregates when the soil is a little bit tighter. But so far, as I recall from our um, data, is we haven't really seen a big advantage either way. Uh, no statistical difference between um, a knife opener or a disc opener. But this particular experiment that we just ran in 2019, again, confirms the fact that uh, going earlier is a, is, is, is a good strategy. Um, and again, no negative consequences around grain yield. Um, and, the, and the cool thing is from 2019 onward, we've seen producers start to adopt this system on a pretty wide scale, broad scale across the prairies in Alberta, Saskatchewan at least, um, all reporting success even in the face of um, pretty devastating uh, frost that followed up when the wheat was at third leaf and so on. Um, temperatures as low as I believe anywhere from minus eight to minus 11. And we know that minus eight is sort of a threshold that can cause some pretty devastating um, lethal effects on, on cereals, but um, they did okay. The, the frost did nothing more than maybe burn the top third of the leaf and that was it and that had no influence on affecting yield so um, pretty good year to test it um, and if we were going to have I think a catastrophic fail we had the conditions present to test that and and all we heard back was success so uh, feeling pretty good about uh, producers being able to adopt and run with this type of system um, and if you can see this this is just the page of funders um, Alberta wheat Western Grains, um, Alberta Innovates, um, and in kind um, through the through our affiliates. Um, so that's sort of the background, and then just a few comments on the plots that um, that you see in front of you. Um, so Jamie and Ken and the rest of the gang were able to go in um, and try to plant at. Um, as many different temperatures as they could, but like we said, it was a year that didn't really allow them to to provide that kind of separation. Plus, as you'll see with the first planting date in front of you, they had a planter malfunction that um, um, caused all of the grain just to run down two runs. So 
Um, so that one, which was, I believe, at the zero, was followed about um, not quite two weeks later by um, what then rapidly warmed up to be 10 degrees. So, so they don't look a whole lot different. The, the, the two row, it's a little bit misleading though, because you have to remember, I, as I understand, you've got probably double the seed rate. So it's gonna look a little bit shorter um, and stunted that way. And in terms of competition, there could be stuff going on that would be um, sort of causing some negative effects. That's a little bit too much competition around resource um, allocations and competitions for those uh, you know, resources. And so um, that said though, um, you know, you can see in front of you, they still look, uh, those two look superior um, to what followed. And what followed was um, uh, 10 days after the 10 degree uh, and then um, about a week or so after that was a 20 degree. But the 14 and the 20 are kind of like more common soil temperatures that were historically used as, as a bit of a guide. Um, and you can see in front of you that definitely probably wouldn't set you up for the kind of success that we're, we're seeing with going ultra early. So, um, so really the, the, the big story around this whole project is that, um, the, the absolute latest you should be waiting is when your soil in the top five centimeters hits two degrees. Um, you, it's not like you're going to suffer some super negative consequence if you wait till six degrees, but the sweet spot is definitely starting at two. The reality is you're not going to see a big difference between, you know, the range of two degrees to six degrees. But the other, the other reality that we're seeing um, is you could probably start at zero and be just fine provided that, you know, the ground wasn't frozen stiff like you saw in the one picture that we experienced in one out of what is now, I believe, 14 site years or so. So I would definitely be moving and getting ready to roll at zero to two degrees rather than, say, a six to ten degrees. Um, because as you know better than anybody, once you do get rolling, that could be... Um, there could be even a further delay if you have some sort of malfunction or unplanned um, scenario pop up in your face uh, during seeding. Um, so I think what I would do is I would end it there with my um, canned presentation.